Let's talk about some disorders of the integumentary system. And let's start with one so common that I suspect everybody has experienced it at one point or another in their life, and that would be a cut or a scrape. A cut or a scrape damages the skin. It damages the epidermis and into the dermis where it damages blood vessels and causes bleeding. There are a couple of problems with this. First, we're losing blood through bleeding, and second, we have an opening in the skin, which prevents it from carrying out the functions it needs to carry out. It's an opening for infection because we're not protected against that anymore, and it's an opening through which we can lose body fluids. The first thing that happens in the healing process is that a blood clot forms. That's important to block the opening and prevent further blood loss or to prevent more things from getting in that shouldn't be in. At the same time as the blood clot is forming, the damaged cells and cells in the area called mast cells are releasing important inflammatory chemicals. And these chemicals that are being released increase blood flow to the area, which is important to bring in more oxygen and nutrients for healing. And they also attract white blood cells or macrophages. These macrophages are important because they are the cleanup crew. The macrophages come in and they phagocytize or engulf the damaged cells, bits of tissue, any foreign material or bacteria that might have gotten in from the outside, basically clean up what doesn't belong. If any particular pathogens got in through the opening, the macrophages can also activate the immune system to mount a response against that, hopefully before it establishes an infection. Once the cleanup has happened, we have to repair the damaged tissue. If you remember the characteristics of epithelial cells, epithelial cells divide quickly and so they can repair relatively easily. The epidermis of the skin is made of epithelial cells, and so we have what's called regeneration of the epithelium. The epithelial cells of the epidermis will divide to create new cells and heal the epidermis. The dermis is a little bit trickier because the dermis is made of dense, irregular connective tissue. And connective tissue contains fewer cells with lots of extracellular matrix fibers between them. In order to heal the dermis, we do see some cell division. We see more fibroblasts being made. But those fibroblasts have to secrete fibers to actually heal the damaged area. And that healing by the production of fibers is called fibrosis. And it's not quite able to reconstruct the original configuration of the tissue. So this is why we sometimes end up with scarring. It's the buildup of these fibers to heal the damaged area of the dermis. Burns are another common disorder of the integumentary system. I'm sure that most of us have experienced a burn at one point or another. Burns can be caused by a lot of different things, including fire, hot objects, sunlight, UV radiation, electricity, or chemicals. Regardless of what causes the burn, we classify burns based on how much tissue is damaged. In a first degree burn, only the epidermis is damaged. We still see symptoms because we have damaged the cells, those damaged cells will release signals to activate inflammation, so we can see symptoms like redness and possibly swelling, and they can be mildly painful. Because the damage is only to the epidermis, these burns heal by regeneration, so we just divide the cells of the epidermis to make more cells, and we can heal the damage that way, often in just a day or two. A sunburn is a common example of a first degree burn. However, some sunburns can be classified as second degree burns. In a second degree burn, there's damage to the epidermis and into the dermis. In addition to redness, when we have this damage to the dermis, we see swelling and often blistering and more severe pain than is experienced with a first degree burn. In a second degree burn, the epidermis will still heal by regeneration, by those cells dividing to create more epidermal cells. However, in cases where the stratum basale of the epidermis is too damaged by the second degree burn to be able to regenerate from there, we get regeneration of the epidermis 
from the epidermal cells that are found in the hair follicles and the glands. So those cells can actually repopulate and form new epidermis. The dermis, also being damaged, will be healed by the process of fibrosis. Macrophages will come in and phagocytize the damaged tissue, and then the fibroblasts will create new fibers of collagen and elastic fibers. This will take longer than the healing of the epidermis and can cause scars. So occasionally you can have scarring from a second degree burn. A third degree burn involves the full thickness of the skin. So the entire epidermis is damaged and the entire dermis is damaged down to the underlying hypodermis or muscle tissue. With this type of burn, because you've damaged the entire thickness of the skin, there is a high risk for infection, for fluid loss, and even shock from the toxic effects of all the dead cells. Because a third degree burn damages the full thickness of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, we don't have any more stratum basale to regenerate from, the hairs and glands are destroyed, as are the nerve endings in that area of the skin. Because of this, it's very difficult to heal third degree burns. They heal very slowly and they tend to produce a lot of scarring and third degree burns often require skin grafts in order to heal. In a skin graft, a section of skin is taken from elsewhere on the body and then put over the burned area in order to provide the uh, cells that you need in order to regenerate the epidermis and the dermis. The final skin disorder I want to talk about is skin cancer. Most skin cancers are caused by UV damage to the DNA. UV light damages the DNA and as part of the repair process for this damage, sometimes the wrong nucleotides are put in, so we get a mutation. It's an accumulation of mutations in the DNA that causes cells to lose control of the cell cycle. And so instead of just dividing as needed, they start dividing out of control. The fact that most skin cancers are caused by UV damage gives us a number of risk factors to consider. Here are some of the risk factors for skin cancer. First, people with light skin have less melanin, which means there's less protection for their DNA and they're more likely to damage it and more likely to have mutations as a result of that damage. Older people are at a higher risk for skin cancer because the older you are, the more your skin has been exposed to UV light over your lifetime and the more damage accumulates, increasing the risk of a mutation that could lead to cancer. The face and hands have a higher risk for skin cancer than other areas of the body for the same reason. Your face and your hands are exposed to the UV light the most and therefore accumulate the most damage over your lifetime. Finally, anything that increases your exposure to UV light will increase your risk of skin cancer. That includes things like using tanning beds. A tanning bed uses UV light to stimulate the melanocytes to produce more melanin, but in the meantime, it's also damaging the DNA. Working outdoors means you have an increased risk of skin cancer because you're simply exposed to UV light more often. Not using sunscreen increases your risk of skin cancer, again, because there's more damage or any other exposure to UV light. The different types of skin cancer are classified based on which cells are affected. The most common type of skin cancer is what's called a basal cell carcinoma. It's called a basal cell carcinoma because it's in the cells of the stratum basale. These cells typically divide a lot anyway, so it's not a far stretch for them to start dividing a little bit too much. That's why this is a very common type of skin cancer. This is also the least deadly type of skin cancer. This type of skin cancer tends to grow slowly and not to spread. And because of that, as long as it's caught early enough, basal cell carcinomas are almost always completely cured with simply excising or cutting out the area that has the cancerous cells in it. A squamous cell carcinoma is the cancer of the cells in the stratum spinosum. This type of skin cancer, like basal cell carcinoma, is rarely fatal as long as it's caught early. However, it will sometimes metastasize, which it means it begins to spread out into neighboring tissue and even spread to other areas of the body. So sometimes we can find squamous cell carcinomas that have spread to the lymph nodes, 
and that's an indication that they have spread elsewhere in the body. And that's a lot harder to fix because you can't simply cut out the squamous cell carcinoma. You also have to deal with the cells that are spread further into the body with things like chemotherapy or radiation. The most dangerous form of skin cancer is melanoma. In a malignant melanoma, we have a cancer of the melanocytes. You might not have noticed this from the earlier pictures, but melanocytes are branching cells. So they tend to spread and branch anyway, which makes it easier for them to invade nearby tissue and eventually to metastasize or spread to other areas. The key to melanoma is early detection. We use what's called the ABCs of skin cancer to help detect melanoma at an early stage. The A stands for asymmetry. Symmetrical moles or spots on the skin are less likely to be malignant melanoma than asymmetrical spots. So in this picture you can see on the top row we have benign moles, just not dangerous spots on the skin, and on the bottom we can see some examples of malignant melanoma, and you can see that they are asymmetrical. The B stands for border. Benign moles will tend to have a very defined, clear, smooth border, whereas the malignant melanoma spots have a very irregular border. The C is color. Benign spots will tend to be all the same color, whereas areas with malignant melanoma would have variations in the color, some darker areas and some lighter. The D is for diameter. Anything with a diameter larger than about six millimeters, so that's going to be larger than a, a pencil eraser, anything that's going to be wider than that is considered suspicious and should be checked out just in case it's malignant. And finally, the E is for evolution. Because normal moles will tend to just stay the way they are for your whole life, whereas malignant melanoma is going to change and spread. So, so if you have a spot that's asymmetrical with an irregular border, varied colors, larger than six millimeters and changing, you should definitely have that checked out by a physician. It might be nothing, but you don't want to take the risk when early detection is the key to curing malignant melanoma.